Good afternoon. I have another um, short testimony, and um, this also relates to happiness. Sometimes um, things that we don't consider to be times when we should be happy is when the Lord wants us to be happy. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now I want to ask you, what does that mean in everything good things? What it means is it means especially in the bad times. Because we know that in good times we always give thanks. So God wants us to be happy and to be thankful to him even in the bad times. Did you know that? How many of you are thankful that you know the Advent message? Amen. How thankful are you really for it? Would you be willing to go to prison for it? And would you be willing to die for it? The reason I ask this question is, uh, we have in the verse, 2 Timothy 3.12, and uh, Caitlin actually read this verse last night, 2 Timothy 3.12. Um, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.12, something that is very can be very stirring to us. 2 Timothy 3.12 The Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And that can sound serious. Does God want us to be happy while we're <coughs> suffering persecution? Do you think he does? Okay. There are different types of suffer persecution. Sometimes we may be suffering trials or tribulations in our life, and we consider that a type of persecution. But we also know that one day soon there will be a Sunday law, and each of us will be persecuted. And many of those that are here that come from Eastern European countries, Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary, um, some of my grandparents, so on and so forth, many of these people were put in prison or in jail because of their faith. And we all will be tested one day soon because of this, brothers and sisters. I want to share a short story. Um, I call it Stories from Africa. So at, right after I came to the Lord, I'm going to try to make it as short as I can because it's like an hour story, but I'm going to make it in five, ten minutes. Um, right after I came back to the Lord and started serving Him, I was blessed to go to South Africa to help um, see if we would have be able to have a canvassing project. In South Africa, it's very hard to canvass because of the crime. Everything is gated. So the brethren asked me to go check it out, and I went, and I said, tell you what, we can't canvas homes because every home is gated, but we can canvas businesses. They said, great, we want you to come a year before, and we want you to encourage the youth from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, to come and participate in this canvassing program. And I said, great. So I came to South Africa. I was there for about a week and a half. I was encouraging all the youth, and they said, okay, now it's time to go to Zimbabwe. And I wasn't familiar with Zimbabwe, and I went to Zimbabwe. I got off the airplane. As I got off the airplane, I filled out the immigration <coughs> documents, and I was waiting to be seen, and the immigration officer called me, and he pulled me aside, and he said, you need to stand over here. I said, okay. After everyone had gone through, he pulled me to his, um, his little section, and he said, you know what, sir, I'm very sorry but we will not be able to let you into our country. And I said, what? My heart just sank. In order to cut time, I'm not going to share why, but I asked him, can you, can you not understand, are you a Christian, sir? He said, yes. I said, look, I'm coming here to share my testimony with young people, and in those countries there's a lot of young people who are into drugs and crime because there's 80% unemployment. Zimbabwe is a country that suffers terribly from corrupted government. And I said, do you not understand as a Christian that the enemy doesn't want me to come and share my testimony? He said, sir, I understand, but there's nothing I can do. He said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to deport you, but before we deport you, there's no more flights that leave out of here today, so we'll have to detain you. And I said, okay, but I still had faith that somehow while I was being detained, they wouldn't let me in the country. So they put me aside, and eventually they escorted me out of the airport. As I was being escorted out of the airport, 
the brethren that were there to receive me, they said, Brother Ballback, Brother Ballback. I said, yes, I never knew them, but they knew who they were looking for. They said, don't worry, with God's help, we're going to get you in the country. I said, okay. So they took me to the main town, and I was in the main town in the main immigration office, and we took all of my bags out of the car, and um, uh, I ended up going behind the desk. After we took my bags out of the car, I wasn't sure if I was under arrest. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, so they were friendly to me. I was like six immigration officers in this truck when we went to town. So when we got out of the car, it was a unique experience. So I pulled out my phone and I said, is it okay for a selfie? And they said, no. <laughs> they were very serious. Then I realized it was serious trouble. And when we pulled up to the immigration office, there was like a little bungalow behind. And I thought, oh, maybe that's where I'll be detained for the night. I went behind the counter. And as I was behind the counter, what do you think I was doing? I was praying and I was reading. I was reading God's word. And I was memorizing one verse in particular. It was Romans 8, 28, the key text for my sermon today. And we know all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. I was, rec I was memorizing this because I needed strength at that time because I didn't know what would happen. I was in this third world country all by myself. I had no control over anything. And I was in the hands of people. I was at their mercy. And as I was reading that Bible verse, one of the immigration officers came up to me while the other ones were in the room having a conference about what to do with me. And she said, sir, I just want to encourage you to trust in the Lord and don't fear. She said, I'm so happy to see you're reading your Bible. And she, um, she told me, I want to share my favorite Bible verse with you. I said, sure, I would love that. It was uh, Psalms 91 verse 7. The Bible says... A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right side, and no harm shall come near thee. She said, remember that verse. And I was worried, because that Bible verse is talking about thousands of people dying. And I thought, what's going to happen? Are they going to behead me? <laughs> and I told her, I said, I like your Bible verse, but I like mine better. Romans 8, 28, and I shared it with her. She said, I know that verse too, that's a good one. But you just make sure and remember the one I told you about. And then I realized it was serious. After a few minutes, they came out of the office. And some other brethren came. They knew they had known my grandfather. They said, hello, Brother Ballback. We knew your grandfather. We're doing everything to try to get you out <coughs> to come, you know, to stay in the country before being deported. But we can't take you at the moment. I said, okay. It was 5 o'clock, and they said, let's go. So we got back in the truck. And we're going through the city. About five minutes later, we enter this one-way street, and there's just a big block wall on one side and a housing community on the other side. And I, I know what the worst-case scenario is, but I'm hoping I don't end up there. We end up getting to the end of the wall, and then we turn to the left, and there's gates and bars and guys with machine guns, and it says, Welcome to Bulawayo Prison. It didn't say welcome. He just said, well, a while in prison. <laughs> so we enter into the prison, and I'm still having faith. I'm, you know, this is just the Lord testing me. Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to be with the brethren. Can you imagine the worst reality to be in a third world prison? It's not very exciting. We enter in. We come in the first set of the gates. They say, okay, take your stuff out. And now the immigration authorities are talking to the prison officials. And they're negotiating. Again, I try to take a picture because the prison building is very neat. Again, I'm strictly rep reprimanded. I realize it's really serious. They finally open the first door. I come into the little reception area of the prison. I'm questioned, so on and so forth. Before you know it, the immigration officials are saying something to the prison officials. They're leaving. I'm now in the hands of the prison officials. So I understand I'm not really being detained. I'm going to be in the prison. And I'm praying I have faith in the Lord. All this time, by the way, with the immigration officials and the other officials, they were asking me, because they weren't there when the first immigration officer was talking to me, they were asking me why I was in the country. And so I was able to share my testimony with each and every one of them, and how the Lord delivered me from a life of addiction, and how I was there to share that with their young people. So I could see that God was using me there, 
But my purpose wasn't to be there in the prison. My purpose was to be there to encourage the young people in the churches. And I was hoping that's what I was going to do because I didn't want to sleep in the prison. So it, it went on and finally it came to the point where the prison guard took this big key ring with maybe 50 keys and he started opening one gate. It took five minutes to find the right key. He opened that gate, another gate, another gate. We're in three levels of the prison. And I've been praying the whole time that the brethren would come and they say, Brother, we got you. You're able to stay in the country. But um, no. The reason, and by the way, the reason why they couldn't deport me right away is that was the last flight for the evening out of that airport. So that's why they had to detain me. So we finally enter the prison. I end up getting booked in the prison. Um, and I was tested because one of the because until this time all the officers were very polite with me, but there was one officer who was very, very kind of strong, and you could see he wanted me to retaliate because he wanted to maybe keep me longer there. And so he asked me, Are you a Christian? But he asked in a very strong way, and my old, uh, my old self came up, and I wanted to speak back in a wrong, strong way, but Holy Spirit calmed me down, and I said, yes, sir, I'm a Christian. And he said, where is your Bible? Again, he's shouting at me, you know. And I said, okay, just a moment. I calmed down. I found my backpack. I pulled out my Bible. It was a Bible just like this, exact same size, exact same size. I had bought it um, the year earlier with my fiancé at the time, at the GC, we bought it together. We both had two matching black Bibles. And he looked at the Bible. He said, whoa, this is a good American Bible. And he slammed it on the table. And he says, this Bible needs to stay here. And at that time, I was a little bit frustrated because that was the Bible. I had a matching Bible with my wife. And, you know, but the Lord was testing. He was testing me too. But what was I there for? I was a missionary, right? So I said, okay, of course, of course, you can have the Bible with a big smile. <laughs> Later, long story short, he softened down, but I know he was testing me, and I actually signed the Bible over to him. He wanted me to sign the Bible, and I signed the Bible, and I signed uh, our church name, S-D-A-R-M, Bulawayo. And I told him, make sure when you read this Bible, you go to this church, because this Bible only works in this church. <laughs> and so he promised he would. Um, now it was time to, to find my room, and so we were looking for my room, and uh, the two guards that were escorting me to the room, I could tell, because all the inmates were in their cells, and I could tell, by the way, I had to put on their, the prison garb, and it was terrible, there's no laundry system there, it, it was just, whew, you could just smell the odor of who knows how many previous people and uh, so I'm wearing the prison garb, and, and we're going to find my room, and you can see the guards are like looking, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You can see they're, what, you know, I'm thinking, are they eeny, meeny, miny, moing to put me in a bad cell or in a good cell? You understand? Were they looking out for me, or they were saying, let's really show this American a, a good time? So I was praying for, for God. Still, I'm thinking the brethren are going to come, and I'm going to be able to go and stay with the brethren. Finally, they open, they find the door. Five minutes later, after finding the right key, they open the door, and it's already lights out. So this room is small. It's maybe 10 by 10 or smaller, and there's already six guys laying on the floor. And they open the door, and I'm about to walk in. I have my, my rolls, my uh, blankets, three blankets, which are your, your blankets, your pad, and your pillow. And I'm about to walk in, but I can't because there's nowhere to step. And I'm looking at these six guys on the ground, and I'm looking at them, and I'm thinking, oh, man, they probably think I'm here to steal their bed, you know, and who's this foreigner coming? And uh, so we kind of look at each other, and they're surprised at me because they hadn't seen a, a, a white man in their prison. It just was not seen. They're looking at me, and I'm looking at them. It seemed like minutes, and we're just looking at each other. What is that? Actually, a couple seconds, and a, and a young man from Congo. Uh, actually, um, his name was Basil. He smiles and he says, hold, hold, just a minute. We're going to make room for you. And I'm tall. And you could imagine there was no space in there when I opened. And they made enough space for me to lay down the whole way. They gave me a hearty welcome and they said, how are you, my friend? What's, you know, after we got locked in, how are you here? What are you doing here? 
I told again, guess what? I was able to share my testimony and how the Lord delivered me from my life of addiction, how I'm in the, being used in the ministry and I'm there to share my testimony with others. They said, you know what? This reminds us of the story of Paul and Silas in the prison. They told, one of them was actually reading a Bible, and I was thankful for that because I knew I had a Bible in the cell because <coughs> mine had, had been given away. They told me, do you know what? There's over 75 cells in this prison, but God sent you to this cell on purpose. That night, uh, as I had just come into the faith, um, I was still learning the key texts, and I didn't know all of them, but they wanted to know about the true, God's true church. They wanted to know about how to know what's God's true church. And so I shared with them the, the verses in uh, Acts about the Bereans and how the Bereans accepted God's word, but they studied daily to see if it was so. And we studied about the state of the dead and the Sabbath. Anything I could remember, I was sharing with them with that one Bible that we had. As the night went on and the next day, the guards called me again and again and again. Pretty soon it was 12 o'clock and they never called me to go home. And I knew I wouldn't go home the next day like they promised because I knew the next plane left at 2 o'clock. And I was worried because I talked to other prisoners who were going to be deported from other countries and they said they had been there two months waiting to be deported. They said that the government, Mugabe, had been there for 30-some years. He was almost 90 years old. He hates Americans. And the government, the prisoners are telling me, the government's very corrupt. And they're always trying to get a bribe, and they won't let me go until they get a bribe. And so I was worried. I had no communication. I was just engaged to my wife. I couldn't communicate with anyone, and, and the Lord was testing my faith. I wasn't released the next day. I don't know how long I'm going to be in here. You hear of those stories where people get released and their beard is down to here. You understand? <laughs> and so the next night, after I shared my testimony with all the prisoners and all the guards, because all the guards that would come on, they would ask for my testimony. Why are you here? Why are you here? They'd never seen a white man in, in the prison there in, in Bulawayo before. I told them the testimony. I knew the Lord wanted me to share my testimony. I knew that was... I started to understand that was the reason that he wanted me to be in Zimbabwe. And, uh, but the next night, uh, it was now the second day, the second night, I started really getting discouraged. I started really getting discouraged, and I thought maybe I would never get out of there. And I was reading the Bible that one of the inmates had that he let me borrow. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, never understand how powerful the Bible can be unless you're in the worst, dire circumstances and then you're reading God's word at that moment. Let me tell you, you really feel the power of God's word. And when I was at loss of, of hope, uh, the Lord directed me, and I was opening the Bible, and some other inmates had had certain parts of Bible verses underlined. And when I was at loss of hope, I had just started turning, and uh, one of the verses was underlined was Zechariah 8, verse 7. Zechariah 8, verse 7, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people. And the part that says, I will save my people, was highlighted. And I knew that God had that highlighted in there just for me. Right below in verse 9, it said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. And the, part, the words, be strong, were highlighted. It wasn't a mistake, brothers and sisters. But I knew the Lord had those verses highlighted just for me. And as I read these, I became strengthened. It was two or three in the morning. And I was just struggling with the Lord, praying like Jacob. The last verse I read was Acts 5.39. Acts 5.39, I came to this verse. And let's turn there. Acts 5, verse 39. And the verse says, But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And when I read this verse, I thought, Praise the Lord! If it is of God that I get free, nobody can overthrow it because they can't fight against God. And I became excited. But a few seconds later, I realized that the opposite could be true, brothers and sisters. That if it was God's will... 
that I was to stay in that prison and to witness for one year, two years, one month, even I could not fight it because it was not God's will. And I realized that I had to be happy with my, if I really, truly love God, I had to be happy with His will for me, not my will. Do you understand what I'm saying? <coughs> and once I realized that, I said, Dear Lord, I kneeled down and I said, Dear Lord, please help me to accept this faith, whatever it may be. I fully put my hands in trust in you. And after I prayed that prayer, brothers and sisters, guess what? I had complete peace. It was a miracle. And I could have, I don't know, but at that moment I felt that with God's help, I could bear whatever it was, two months, three months, one year, we don't know. Praise the Lord, the next day, um, they called me around 12 o'clock, and they told me, where's your Bible? Because they always saw me with the Bible. It wasn't mine, it was the inmates, but they said, where's your Bible? And I said, why? They said, get your stuff, you're going home. Long story short, um, uh, when I was at the airport, when the, 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 the lady that told me the Bible verse, when I was at the airport going home, she told me, your brethren love you very, very much. She said, they are very poor in this country, but she said, the government was trying to get a $1,000 bribe from them. And they thought that you would be scared by the third world prison and that you would say, oh, do whatever to get out and that you would complain or whatever, but you were, you were good. But the brethren felt so sorry for you, they were about to pay $1,000. She said, they loved you that much. They loved you that much. She said, you must have a good church. I said, yes, I do. Please go and visit them. Long story short, um, it was a blessing with all those six inmates. I got very close with them. I don't know what will be the result from that, but I pray that there was a seed planted there that one day I may see one of those in the kingdom. One thing I just want to share is that I was impressed by the Holy Spirit that um, that testimony that I had, um, I needed to have to understand just a small glimpse of one day what we will go through. We will not know what will happen, but we have to trust firmly in our Lord. And, uh, and I was also impressed to come back and to share that with others so that it can be a strength to others. And um, I'm thankful for that testimony, and I'm thankful that um, the Lord was able to use me there in that prison. Thank you for letting me share. Amen. Thank you, Brother Baba, for that wonderful experience. And through that, we can see that when we think there's no way out of something, God always makes a way. Not only does he make a way, but the way he takes also encourages us, brings us up to a higher standard. So let's pray that all of us have that experience today. Um, for our next item, we'll have Brother Joey Zeke, and he has an item entitled Everlasting Grace.